Good day ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to JG7's classroom. This series is all about the arts of dogfighting and tactical air combat, specifically in a World War II environment. In modern lingo, dogfighting is often referred to as basic fighter maneuvers, or BFM for short. BFM covers one versus one situations and provides you with the tools to survive and succeed in those situations. Tactical air combat begins when you fly with at least one wingman against one or multiple targets or opponents. In modern terms this is referred to as air combat maneuvering or ACM for short. You may also he hear the term advanced combat maneuvering. So the purpose of this series is to provide you with those tools, explain them to you, teach them to you and show to you how they are applied in practical scenarios by analyzing practical examples where these tools are applied. I am your host and instructor Killer Fliege and I wish you a pleasant and useful lesson. Alright, so this is the first episode of the classroom series and before we take a deep dive into the combat I want to kickstart this series by laying some groundwork in the fundamentals of aircraft performance. It is absolutely inevitable to study this subject if you ever intend to reach a stone. But since you're here, I assume you are an aspiring virtual fighter pilot who came here to learn. So in this series, you will find three lessons on aircraft performance in which I seek to teach you, aside from the fundamentals of this subject, some tools or approaches or ideas that you can use at home to make your own considerations, just as I do in the videos. Now, a word of caution. There is going to be some mathematics involved, but don't worry, no degree in aeronautical engineering or advanced physics is required <laughs> to follow and understand the lessons. All you need is your high school physics and mathematics and even if they are not <laughs> currently present, don't worry, you will understand, I promise. In a nutshell, what you should be familiar with is principal concepts in trigonometry, cosine, sine and so on and so forth, Newton's law of motion and coordinate systems. That's pretty much it. Now, if you're like me and you appreci appreciate the occasional juggling with equations, feel free to grasp a pen and paper and pause the video at any time to do the juggling of said equations yourself. And at last, if you are interested in the materials presented here, you can acquire them for a small donation. Just contact me in Discord. Contact information is linked in the description below. All right, all set, then let's go, shall we? All right, so aircraft performance. Before we dive into this first episode, let me quickly lay out for you what you're going to learn in these next three videos, so the first three episodes of, of our classroom series. So. In the first video, we are going to cover the first two chapters, which basically are about the forces of flight, so lift, drag, thrust and weight, and lift generation and stall, as stall is a performance limit. Then we are going to have a closer look in chapter two at those performance limits, low speed, high speed, and climb performance. But generally, it's all straight flight. In episode 2 we are then going to look at accelerated flight and speci specifically turn flight. The turn is a circular motion, circular motion is accelerated hence accelerated flight and from these fundamental physical concepts we go all the way to building our flight envelope using all the knowledge that we've built from chapters 1 to 3. And last but not least we are going to specifically look in a bit more detail about or yeah into turn performance in chapter 4 excuse me and yeah we are specifically going to look at best turn rate concepts of corner speed and best sustained turn speed and then we are going to look at EM diagrams okay so 
let's get started with the first chapter, Forces of Flight. This is a picture that most of you are probably familiar with and it basically explains at a very very top level the forces that are acting on an aircraft. As you can see we've just outlined here the airfoil um, as being representative for the aircraft. This is the center of gravity if you will or the pressure point if we are just talking about a, an airfoil and the four forces that are acting on our aircraft at all times no matter what aircraft we're flying is li or our lift thrust weight and drag and you can see there is two protagonists lift and thrust we like those and two antagonists drag and weight and they come in these pairs a few definitions the cord line is basically a connection of the trailing edge of the wing, so it's the rear end, to the leading edge of the wing, which is the front end, to kind of give you an idea how the wing is oriented. Now, usually what happens when we fly through air, or a equivalent would be if we have a static airfoil and we blow air across it, so that would be the scenario of a wind tunnel, but they are essentially the same. We have the airflow coming and bypassing the wing and the angle between our wings cord line and the general direction of the undisturbed airflow is what we call the angle of attack or AOA or alpha. All right, that's what I would like to talk about uh, on this slide about this general picture. So let's explore these forces a little more and what they mean to us as pilots obviously lift is generated by the wing so we connect um, a specific engineering feature or component of our machine to a specific force that is generated so we have the wings but also the fuselage and the empennature the tail plane contribute to lift generation the drag is basically generated by the entire aircraft as an object. Every object moving through air or any liquid for that matter or gas, any um, other medium uh, will have inherent drag. We call this parasitic drag. And the parasitic drag increases with speed. We also have drag that is generated by lift generation we call this induced drag and the induced drag decreases with speed and we will understand why. Thrust is obviously provided by the engine and it is used to propel us forward. Now we will look at this diagram in a minute and then obviously we have weight or gravity um, or in other terms, weight is caused by gravity and for this we have to blame fundamental physics. This is the reason why we actually obviously need lift to stay airborne. Now, to look at some fundamental relationships between thrust, the horsepower, the, the engine outputs and speed and the resulting drag, depending on the speed, we can look at this uh, diagram here and this is a specific or specifically a diagram for propeller driven aircraft and it does not take into account altitude if you take into account altitude it's going to look a bit different but we are not looking at this yet for now so a propeller driven aircraft the engine the propeller engine oops I am sorry decreases in efficiency or capability to provide thrust with increasing speed. So the more faster we fly the less thrust our engine puts out and this is the red curve here. In terms of horsepowers um, they do slightly increase and then decrease again a little bit God damn it! excuse me um, with speed but generally you can assume that 
they are more or less constant. So the horsepower output of a propeller driven aircraft slightly increases with speed or may even be considered constant for simplicity's sake. And then as already mentioned we have two important types of drag. This is one the parasitic drag and you all know this the faster I drive or I go in through a medium the more air resistance I have to overcome hence higher drag and hence it increases with speed and it's a quadru quad proportional to uh, V squared basically induced drag is the drag generated by lift and we'll get to that a bit later um, and it decreases with speed because the faster we fly the less angle of attack we need to um, fly at in order to maintain level flight so maintain our altitude and so this is correlated um, to the angle of attack and this is why it decreases with speed and obviously there will be a maximum speed that we are going to be able to fly and generally speaking once our thrust um, equals our total drag we cannot accelerate any faster or further and hence we are going to reach our V max, our maximum velocity. Now one more thing um, we have indicated by this yellow line a specific excess thrust that we can use and this is basically a measure of how much additional thrust we have uh, as compared to straight flight um, or as compared to the thrust required to maintain a specific speed in straight flight and obviously this thrust we can use to accelerate climb or uh, turn as turns are accelerated flight so this is a typical diagram um, a top level performance diagram for a propeller driven engine now that's all I would like to talk about in terms of drag, lift, um, thrust and weight and let's have a little closer look at lift generation because understanding this helps us to understand um, aircraft performance and how it's relevant for us as a pilot and how what we need to or what conclusions we can draw from from this understanding in terms of how we tweak our performance. Don't worry, I'm not going to make this too complicated. Um, the conclusion of this slide can be found here. The lift force generally that is um, generated is proportional to the dynamic pressure times the surface area of the wing. But let's see how we get to this conclusion. Now it's a bit messy this slide but uh, stay with me I'm going to explain this. So the phenomenon that you see and why airfoils do cr create lift can be attributed to two factors. Somehow an airfoil, that's an observation we can make, generates a low pressure area above the wing and a high pressure area below the wing. Now we know that air wants to flow fl flow from high to low or the low pressure area w acts as a sort of suction force right so the wing is basically sucked upwards or pushed upwards from this air flowing upwards this is one contribution the other contribution is especially the higher we set our angle of attack and this you can easily experiment with if you drive along in your car and you put your hand outside, your hand is a perfectly flat surface, it's not cambered, it doesn't have a specific profile, wing profile, and you just keep it flat, parallel to the road, it's not going to move much, maybe a bit back because of the air resistance, but as soon as you start tilting it, it's going to come up. And this is because of the law of conservation of momentum. As the airflow hits the wing and is deflected, as indicated by these uh, gray lines here, we are going to have a change in impulse, the impulse or momentum. The momentum in our case is uh, speed times 
mass and the, dif the difference or the change in momentum is the change in speed of the airflow in terms of directional change assuming it may be make stay constant but we know that uh, the airflow is going to be decelerated here as well so the change of speed magnitude and direction times the mass of the air that's deflected we don't have a change of mass so this is the the part that's contributing and if we look at the derivative with respect to time of impulse we can write this as i dot um, we get the, the corresponding force and so we find Newton's law um, implemented here to uh, indicate how much force we generate from moving or changing the direction of the airflow by tilting our air profile into the airflow. Now in order to understand the let's call it the aerodynamic part of the lift we need or lift creation or contribution we need to look at Bernoulli's law. Now Bernoulli's law and, and the conservation of mass. Now Bernoulli's law applies to pipes and streamlines or flows through a specific pipe let's say or along a specific streamline to be more abstract and I've driv uh, drawn out for you the kind of streamline that we are looking at. I kept it simple um, to make it understandable. So what we see when we fly through air or air is blown across the wing profile is that there is going to be a disturbance and that's indicated by those streamlines. They're going to propagate upwards and downwards respectively and at some point however this disturbance is going to stop because there is undisturbed air and the mass of the atmosphere that's above here is pulled down by gravity so it's kind of counteracting this disturbance okay and at some point this disturbance stops and hence we have a sort of I just drew it as a sort of borderline imagine this being the oh, I'm sorry the the wall of a pipe okay the same is going to be found on the bottom side but we are just going to look at the top side and the same principle applies inversely to the bottom um, yeah and again on the bottom we'll have a boundary like this and again the air is going to be pushed downwards which kind of opens that um, let's say a pipe to the bottom okay now we know from Bernoulli's law and that if you want to know this in particular you may want to look it up where it comes from but you can basically derive this from experiments if you have a pipe and we are looking at this particular pipe here and this pipe has different cross sections this is basically yeah, the, the, the area available to the fluid to go through um, then it can be found that the total pressure which is the sum of the dynamic pressure and the static pressure is constant okay so the total pressure is always constant that is Bernoulli's law and we have these two contributors the static pressure is just the pressure that is exerted to you by being in a medium that is um, affected by gravity as you go down in a water body the deeper you go the more pressure you're going to feel because the more mass is going to be on top of you and so at any point you can measure a static pressure and the dynamic pressure is what we just talked about which is why the speed the air the speed of the medium flowing goes into that and the density is imagine someone is taking a water hose and is um, hitting you with the water that's propelled through that water hose the water is going to exert a dynamic pressure on you based on its velocity okay now what is important here to remember is that the total pressure is constant and this this observation is the whole reason why we get this low and high pressure area so bear with me um, now how can we derive this without making too much of it if we look at the conservation of mass principle it simply says that mass cannot disappear 
or cannot be created. Mass in total stays the same. Okay? So if we define a mass flux indicated by this dot because the dot indicates a change in time. Okay? And we can write mass as the product of density times volume. Then we can find that um, assuming that this is constant and at a specific cross section, the cross section is going to be constant. We can find or write volume as a cross section times a distance. So if we draw a short distance here, okay distance element then we have the cross section times the height so to speak or the length of this element we have the volume this is where this uh, equation comes from um, then we have these as constant and dx so distance over time distance over time dx dt is speed that's the definition of speed so this is the airflow velocity or speed okay so this is how we can define a mass flux or a flux of mass now interestingly we know that because of the conservation of mass whatever goes into here must go through this cross section must go through this cross section and since there's no let's say outlet or inlet where we can could contribute or uh, retrieve certain amounts of air from the mass flux through all of these cross sections needs to be the same it cannot be otherwise otherwise the 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 law of conservation of mass is not going to be met or satisfied so it needs to be the same everywhere now what this tells us is that if we look at this product and this is constant, we assume the, the fluid is not compressible or the, the, the gas. Um, if we change A, having a larger A here, for example our A1 at the top as compared to our A2 at the top, having a larger cross section means that the, the flow speed needs to go down to keep our uh, mass flow constant. Okay, so what, what can we derive from this? What do we learn? So, since we have conservation of mass and we have a liquid or a fluid, sorry, or a gas flowing through an imaginary pipe of various cross sections, we know the higher the cross section is, the lower the, the speed and the lower the cross section is, the fluid needs to accelerate. And this conclusion is written down here. So, since A1 um, A1 is larger than A2 here, um, we automatically know that our speed here is going to be slower as compared to here. And now looking at Bernoulli's equation, if we, as we say, the constant or find that the constant or the total pressure needs to stay constant, if we and we have different speeds here we can tell that the dynamic pressure f at this position one is going to be smaller than the dynamic pressure at position two okay because we have a slower speed here and since the dynamic pressure at position 1 is smaller than the dynamic pressure at this position 2. In order to keep our total pressure constant, we can conclude that the static pressure at position 1 here is lower, sorry, is higher than the static pressure here. So, because air is accelerated along this wing profile, we find a lower static pressure here and this gives us our lower
air pressure, static air pressure above the wing. And the same approach we can use um, at the bottom. At the bottom, the, the cross section is widened along the wing, which is why um, we'll find a higher pressure area, which because the airflow is decelerated at the bottom. Okay, and this is how we can use Bernoulli's law and the mass of conservation without consulting a book to make those um, derivations and understand how a wing in principle generates lift and the two contributions to that. All right, so if that was a bit fast, just um, look at the slides again. And if you take your time, I'm pretty sure you can follow and and fully understand. Now, this is the only equation that I'm not going to show you how it's derived, but we've already found that the lift seems to be proportional to the dynamic pressure because that's kind of the gives us an idea how much the air is accelerated and to the surface. And the proportional factor that we introduce here is our lift coefficient. So this is this is our lift equation. Um, this is the only one that you should probably learn. And we have here L, our lift, is equal to the dynamic pressure. We could also call this Q. It's found as Q as well, times the so-called lift coefficient, which we will later learn is dependent on the angle of attack and our wing surface area. Now. The lift coefficient, if you rearrange this equation, you will find this and you will see that the lift coefficient is a unitless uh, quantity and it gives you kind of an idea. It's normalized with respect to the dynamic pressure and the wing surface area. So with this quantity, you can compare different wings of different aircraft. Like, for example, if you take an Airbus A380 or a B17, which obviously has a much larger wing than, for, say, a BF109, the total amount of lift that the B17 wings would generate is obviously larger as the absolute, in terms of the absolute amount. Obviously, it also depends on the speed. So if you divide the lift by the dynamic pressure and the wing surface area, you now have a normalized quantity with which you can compare different kinds of wings and their capability to provide produce lift. So now you will see that the higher the lift coefficient or the lift coefficient um, is dependent on the angle of attack, the more efficient or better the wing is as in generating lift. For example, we could potentially find that the lift coefficient of the BF109 wing is higher than the lift coefficient of the um, B17, although in absolute numbers it generates less lift, it would still mean that the BF109's wing is better. A more prominent example, the Spitfire's wing, a nice elliptical wing, elliptical wings have the best lift distributions, hence it is going to have higher CL values, lift coefficients, as compared to the 109. Now, why are we looking at this equation? Um, we want to know, and we will learn why, we want to know which of these quantities we can actually influence as a pilot. Now, obviously, the, the grayed out ones are contributions that we cannot influence, obviously the wing surface area. We cannot necessarily change. Th this is primarily given by the aircraft design unless we have high lift devices like leading edge slats or trailing edge flaps with which if we were to able to control them, we can control the wing surface area. But for warbirds generally, um, we, we do not control this, the wing surface area. We can only alter it by using these high lift devices or secondary flight controls. Um, what we can directly influence in flight is obviously CL, so our lift coefficient, because it's dependent on our angle of attack. And our angle of attack we can influence in flight. We can influence our 
flight speed or velocity obviously and we can influence the altitude we are flying at obviously generally how the distance uh, sorry the density of the air is correlated to the altitude that is given by the yeah fundamental physics of our atmosphere we cannot change those but we can influence at what altitude we are flying so this is kind of a uh, double-edged sword in terms of what we can influence and what we can't okay um, all right so lift equation remember that one now <coughs> we've already talked about the fact that our lift and drag are correlated so when we generate lift we automatically generate drag and this is called the induced drag a visual representation now of how much drag we produce or how much lift we produce um, how much drag we produce when we produce a certain amount of lift we can define a so-called lift to drag ratio and a visu visual representation is this uh, CDCL polar or Lilienthal polar so this this was devised this graphic was devised by um, Otto Lilienthal um, when he uh, tried to find ways to yeah, calculate or determine the amount of lift that profiles, wing profiles create. Now as I've mentioned, not mentioned yet, but we have a so-called drag coefficient which is correlated to the lift coefficient and the drag equation hence looks very similar to the lift equation so the drag equation goes like this drag is q so the dynamic pressure we had times cd times s so the only difference here is the the drag coefficient with respect to the lift co equation which was q dynamic pressure times cl times s okay um, if we look at this polar where we drag the uh, plot the two coefficients as a function of one another we can find speeds or positions that are relevant for us as, as pilots for example if our engine was to fail and we want to find out the best speed that we should fly at in order to cover the most distance we want to be at our best lift to drag ratio so we want to be at a position where we generate the most kind of lift with respect to the drag that's generated because then we can glide the furthest distance which may be interesting if you're over a forest area and you only have a set amount of altitude to cross that and find a proper landing field okay um, we have a so-called aspect ratio the the aspect ratio and I'm just I just put this there because it's it's relevant for the for the um, connection between lift and drag coefficient this is basically the wingspan B and we have the surface area s and um, aspect ratio is defined as B squared div divided by surface area. It basically tells you how elongated the wing is with respect to its surface area. Okay? How slim or fat, if you will. And then we have a so-called Oswald factor, which is an efficiency uh, factor. Now, if we look at this polar to get back to our best glide speed, just Graphically looking at it, we can solve this problem of finding our best glide speed by simply putting a tangent to the polar's back, if you will, right there. Because this is the, let's call this angle alpha, it's not the angle of attack, but this is going to be the tangent or um, the connector to the graph with the highest slope that means that a higher slope means you have a higher L to D ratio because the slope is basically defined as DCL divided by D 
CD. So the higher the slope, the more lift with respect to drag. Hence, we can find the best, if we, if we were to have a polar like this, we can find our best glide speed by finding this, this point. Now obviously, we are going to have a maximum lift that we, we can produce. We get to that in a minute. Okay, so this is the Lilienfeld Polar and how it can be used to determine a best glide speed. What I would like to point out or show, just for complete sake or completeness sake, I want to show how the lift and drag coefficients are connected. And uh, this can be shown here. So, um, as you can see, um, oh, some of the parts of the equation is left here so let me write this down this is basically this equation up here sorry for that I didn't see that so this is our drag equation and hence we can write do the same as before we can define the drag coefficient as the drag generated divided by the um, dynamic pressure times the surface area now this drag coefficient is gonna have two components the parasitic component and the induced component and the induced component can be written as such so this is how you see how the how the drag coefficient is dependent on the lift coefficient so um, you have this equation I'm not, I'm not going to derive this right now um, but that's basically how a drag how your drag coefficient would look like and then if we were to define a lift to drag ratio we can also call this epsilon um, and we can write this equation as such. So now we just need to know the lift and drag, uh, the lift coefficient at a certain angle of attack. We need the drag coefficient um, that's uh, connected to the parasitic drag. The aspect ratio of the wing is the geometric um, geometric quantity, and we can determine our lift to drag ratio. Okay, I just wanted to show you this to see how the lift coefficient and the drag coefficient are connected. Okay, to kind of get an understanding or a feeling for why you generate lift, sorry, you generate drag when you generate lift. Okay, moving on. What is more relevant for us as pilots is when do we actually get into this position whoops, of stall. Stall, we all know, is a situation when the airflow detaches from our airfoil. This is, for the nerds among you, or the experts among you, a geometric stall. There's different kinds of stall. We're just going to look at a geometric stall, though. When the airflow detaches from the wing profile. Now, in normal flight conditions, you have the air that's coming um, and flowing across the wing profile. The stagnation point is basically where the air divides between the upper path and the lower path. Um, and you're going to have laminar flow. Laminar flow means that all air molecules have the same speed and the speed has the same direction. Um, an example for this would be if you open your water tub at home, just as much as you can still see through it as it stays transparent then you because all the water molecules go the same direction in a very orderly fashion you can see through it as soon as you open the tap too much the air becomes uh, the, the water becomes turbulent and you will not be able to see through it anymore the same thing kind of happens on a wing profile toward the trailing edge there's going to be a transition point where the laminar airflow slowly starts to become turbulent and there's going to be a separation point toward the trailing edge where the airflow close to the boundary or co close to the surface is going to detach from it and it's going to induce turbulence or turbulent airflow and this is a normal situation for a conventional wing now as you increase angle of attack these two points are going to move forward along the wing and if they move too far forward that the airflow cannot follow the wing profile anymore they it's going to detach right at the beginning and you have turbulent airflow all along 
detached turbulent airflow, the wing does not produce any lift anymore because as we saw from the lift equation, you need airflow across the wing surface to produce lift. Okay. Now, another representation in terms of how can we figure out when the stall happens or how our angle of attack is connected to that phenomenon is if we look at a CL alpha plot. Okay, for conventional um, profiles, the, the, the relationship between your angle of attack and your lift coefficient is for the most part linear. Now, a conventional profile, because it's cambered in a certain way, will have a so-called lift coefficient or null lift coefficient, if you will, that so it, it generates lift at angle of attack zero. Okay? Aerobatic profiles or symmetrical profiles do not have that. A symmetrical profile would be here. But usually usually the warbirds we fly in DCS or any other simulator do have conventional profiles, so it's gonna look somewhat like this. And it's it's pretty much linear as you go along. But there's gonna be a point when the lift coefficient is going to reach its maximum and this is just before the wing is about to stall so as we generate more angle of attack w the lift coefficient goes up because as we've saw seen earlier the let's say the contribution of the air being deflected is going to increase and the larger the angle of attack the larger let's say the wing is is curved the more difference in pressure we're going to generate between the upper and the lower area but that's going to have a limit as soon as we hit that limit of geometric stall if we go beyond this critical al uh, angle of attack we call this alpha critical or critical angle of attack we're going to be in the stall region so beyond this point we cannot fly the wing does not generate lift here in this region we can fly okay so this is the the relationship between the angle of attack and how we now know or now we know how we can influence our lift directly by increasing the angle of attack so we know if we increase our angle of attack in this region or we double our angle of attack we're going to double our lift coefficient okay and given that we fly at the same speed that would mean we have twice the lift. Pretty decent, isn't it? Now the question is, can we determine when a stall actually happens? Because we would like to know f with the instruments that we have available to us in our cockpit, we would like to know when does this happen? So we need a connection between the phenomenon of stall and speed because we have a speed gauge or a speedometer in our cockpit. So this is the, the quantity that we want to connect to the stall phenomenon um, to avoid getting into a stall after all. And this leads us to the second chapter which is the performance limits in straight flight. Chapter 2 let's look at some performance limits in straight flight and the first we're going to look at is basically straight and level flight so we are flying along and basically now that applies more to to dive but if you think about the spectrum of speeds that we can fly then obviously we can fly very slow and we can fly very fast and at some point when we fly very slow we're gonna end up in a stall we all know this, we've all experienced this. If you fly too fast, at some point we will most likely encounter structural limits. So there are two speeds um, that pose a performance limit in straight flight. So let's look at the stall speed first. Mm. If you wondered why certain planes do have higher stall speeds than others, 
and why high lift devices work here and provide some salvation in terms of being able to fly slower than without them we can simply consult literally the lift equation down here and see the the stall speed the slowest speed that we can fly in level flight so how do we go about it and this is what i mentioned earlier with these simple thoughts and experiments thought experiments you can you can do stuff like this at home and you don't need any background in in engineering it's just a um basic skills or the basic knowledge that you've obtained throughout high school in terms of physics and mathematics very simple so in order to stay airborne if we want to answer the question how slow can we fly and can we compute this from you know for our aircraft's design um, we would have to satisfy the following conditions obviously we don't want to lose altitude so lift needs to equal weight that is the first condition we need to meet so we don't fall out of the sky the second condition is that thrust equals drag because if we get any slower um, we are going to go below stall speed and then obviously sp stall and again fall out of the sky so these are kind of yeah kind of uh, intertwined okay so but to to determine our stall speed we need the first one uh, first and foremost to calculate this now since we say lift and weight are supposed to be equal we can enter weight because weight is a force um, contrary to what the common unit kilogram would have you believe um, we can add this into our lift equation so we have our weight is equal to our lift yeah? so on this side we have our lift written and this should be satisfied in straight flight all the time so we, 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 we basically stay level now what are the limits we've seen the the graph earlier alpha CL plot at some bo point we're gonna hit CL max we know this is right before the stall point and this is the maximum CL we can get so we just take that value which we achieve at the critical alpha and put this into our equation so we write here CL max and then we rearrange for speed we just switch back to a proper uh, or less confusing terminology so we switch back to V as symbol for speed I just earlier didn't use it to not confuse it with volume so this is our speed um, and you do the basic math you, you you bring all of these on one side because you want to solve for speed and then you have to put the square root around everything and this is how you end up with your stall equation or stall speed equation now as you can see predominant factors determining stall speed are obviously the weight of the aircraft so the heavier we are the higher the stall speed so if 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 weight goes up stall speed is going to go up wing surface area so the lower the wing surface area the larger stall speed gets so again if we lower wing surface area stall speed goes up cl max so the lift capa lift producing capability of our wing the lower CL max is, so the less lift efficient or efficient in terms of lift um, creation our wing is, stall speed goes up. The higher our density is, 
stall speed goes down. So the higher we fly, the higher our stall speed. So if this goes down, stall speed goes up. Okay? So it is not a fixed number. On your instrument it is. We will get to this in future lessons. In indicated airspeed it's always going to be the same whether you fly at sea level or 10,000 meters because it's the way the speed indication works because your speedometer basically maps pressure onto speed or the other way around maps speed to a certain pressure according to the uh, standard atmosphere rig model and that means that um, when you when the density goes down and you maintain the same speed the pressure that's measured goes down and so the indicated speed also goes down which is why in effect the stall speed indicated is going to be the same however your true speed is going to be different whether you fly at various altitudes and your true airspeed would show a different stall speed depending on your altitude okay just by looking at this equation we can see what happens now if you want to optimize for slower stalls or lowest possible stall speeds within our aircraft's design limits what we can do is we can reduce weight so dump fuel if we can do that or make sure we don't have too much payload with us we can fly at a lower altitude if there's an option and we can increase our wing surface area by using secondary flight controls or so-called high lift devices like flaps trailing edge flaps or leading edge slats by extending those we we can increase the that is our wing surface area without them and let's say from here to here that is now our wing service surface area with high lift devices okay so this is in very simple terms how that would help all right so this is this is our slow speed limit now the other one is rather a no brainer how fast can we fly well technically until our aircraft breaks apart <laughs> so this happens due to air loads air loads induce vibrations vibration can induce stress and so on and so forth so eventually your structure is going to suffer especially if you load the aircraft with additional g's but we get to accelerated flight in the next lessons so the, the never exceed speed is defined by the aircraft designer they know the engineers they know what the design can tolerate and then they derive a speed that is safe to fly but that you shouldn't exceed um, if you do exceed that speed you run the risk of causing structural damage so read the manual important in terms of your never exceed speed you need to know this you need to know what speed your aircraft is capable of flying without breaking apart so this is the higher limit now let's look at climb performance climbing we look at now only in a straight flight condition so a straight climb um, and again although this may seem or look complicated at first it really isn't it is just trigonometry and some basic um, application of Newton's law how we get to the equations and you see on the next slide we can simplify this problem even further by just using a different Lee rotated coordinate system so within the typical coordinate system this is our earth surface so x is along the earth surface and y is our altitude or along the distance or the away from the earth surface um, and we look at an aircraft climbing basically looks like this there is weight that's going to pull it down toward the surface we have a lift vector that is perpendicular to the flight path or the velocity vector the velocity vector in this case is upwards because the air effectively is flowing like this 
how long our plane there's going to be some sort of angle of attack uh, because the wings are angled and the air may be coming slightly from another angle but for simplicity's sake we keep it as such and we have the thrust obviously uh, pointing parallel or in the same direction of our speed and we have drag which is opposite of thrust now what we then do before we go to the equations we split using trigonometry we have our climb angle sorry it's not much visible gamma um, so we can split our vectors into their respective components so x component y component for each vector note weight is already within uh, or parallel to the y-axis so we don't have to split that apart but all the others we do have and now in order to figure out if we can maybe calculate the thrust required to do a certain climb at a certain angle depending on the lift and, and drag and weight of the aircraft or you know what we will later see um, determine the aircraft's climb performance with in a term co we call specific access power but as I said next slide you will we will get to that um, we, we basically apply again Newton's second law in this case um, this is what's here or first law sorry so this is basically objects that are in motion stay in motion and if there is no resulting force acting on them they're not going to accelerate or decelerate so if all forces here are in equilibrium it, the, the plane will fly at constant speed and this is what we want good thing is about looking at constant cases is that it's easier to compute but also from a pilot or a practical point of view it's 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 good to have let's say a constant climb speed because mm -hmm. that means that you are flying energy efficient or at your maximum performance say you climb and your speed decreases then you climb too steeply and at some point you are going to stall out if and you know unless you want to do that in a dogfight but if it's about maximizing your climb performance if you climb too shallowly and your plane exce accelerates if you are at uh, full throttle then you don't use all your climbing power available so you, you can adjust so after all to do a maximum performance climb energy neutral let's say so we maintain our speed so we can f literally climb up until our service ceiling is reached um, we want to keep v constant and that makes this whole problem a little easier because then we can apply L newton's law as you can see here the first thing we do is we put together all the forces in x dimension so we have positive direction and negative direction so all the the vectors with or magnitudes of vectors with minus signs point the other way and we can simply write it as such we have the x component of the thrust pointing in the positive direction and the minus components or uh, the x components of drag and lift pointing opposite so negative and if we use our trigonometry we can write it down as such we do the same thing in the y dimension and again using the same logic and the same trigonometry um, we end up with this now as I've already mentioned for a constant climb rate basically a s upward speed so this is our climb rate here um, we need forces in X and Y constant because then the speed doesn't change because we don't accelerate or decelerate so we can come up with this condition all the for the sum of all forces in the X dimension is supposed to be zero and if we write this down then we 
end up with this equation and this makes sense if we look at the picture this component needs to be equal to these two components so you know the for balance of forces is guaranteed so it's basically just rearranging this equation from up here so from looking at the x dimension we would get thrust required we just solve for thrust and our um, variable is obviously our climb angle um, drag and lift at this point are parameters because they depend on the current speed that we are flying and we intend to maintain and then they are basically parameters that we could set in so what we can vary is basically our climb angle so we, we're going to write thrust required with regards to the climb angle and then we just rearrange the equation make use of when we divide sine by cosine this is tangents um, cosine divided by cosine is obviously 1 so this goes away and if we use um, a an equation that we will find later on which is that L equals cosine gamma we will find this on the next slide we end up here so the thrust required is going to be this we can do the same thing in the y direction and we end up as such we have these components on one side versus the component these components on the other side just rearranging this equation again using the same logic that the forces needs need to be balanced so positive forces equals negative forces in terms of direction we rearrange the equation and solve for thrust um, and we end up with this and using the same logic and do a little bit of juggling I'm sure if you pause the video and you do this just using these we end up with the same equation it must be obviously we must get the same result from either direction because otherwise our uh, result would would be inconclusive and we get to the same result although in the beginning it looked a bit different but in the end we get to the same result and last but not least we can find that um, we can de de determine our climb rate if we know our climb angle and we know our total velocity for example indicated by our um, instruments and then maybe correct it for true or calibrated airspeed we can estimate our climb rate by uh, multiplying that speed with the cosine sorry with the sine of our climb angle it is supposed to be gamma okay so again there is a lot of trigonometry involved a lot of force or vector separation here so let's make it a bit easier which is where we find um, the equation I, I, I showed earlier um, but since it's the same problem we can use the same um, equations because they are universally true obviously once found within the problem so all we do is we just rotate the coordinate system this way by gamma so the x dimension is along the velocity vector and then you see the only component we have to divide into its subcomponents is weight okay but we use the same logic again we want to know the forces in the new x direction and the new y direction so this is basically how it used to look let's call it sorry y naught and this is the new one so we just rotated it by gamma um, we look at the forces in the y direction and we just need to satisfy the same condition they need to be zero for a constant climb rate or a constant speed again as I said same logic and then we solve the x di direction for thrust 
note that in this case we don't see any thrust in the y direction because yeah it doesn't have a component in the new coordinate system and we can find this equation so the thrust required is this and as you can see it is consistent with what we found here so good and if we rearrange this a little bit for sine gamma so we can basically determine our um, climb angle based on thrust and drag and weight in the current situation we can end up with this equation and again from the y direction we can conclude that the lift needs to be equal to the vertical component or the y component of weight all right now if we want to determine our climb rate our climb rate is basically delta h over t so the the altitude diff or the difference in altitude over time um, and here again that will be that so our aircraft at t so time zero is here we're gonna climb and at t1 another uh, some time later it's going to be here and this is going to be our delta altitude and the time required to get from here to here obviously dividing that by the altitude difference gained that would be our climb rate assuming that we are climbing at a constant climb rate so we can make this simple division here and we've already established that it is our speed times sine of gamma we've established that from the earlier slide so that's why it made sense to look at this problem from two angles and now we find we have a equation for sinus gamma we have an equa we have sinus gamma here we basically put this into here because that's sinus gamma and then we find this v over weight so speed over weight times thrust minus drag bear in mind thrust and drag are both dependent on velocity or uh, functions of velocity and this this term is called or defined as specific excess power and here given in the units of a climb rate so you have speed which is meters per second we have weight which is um, kilogram meters per second squared so f equals m times a right um, or newtons you have newtons here you have newtons here um, and then you can um, get rid of the newtons and you're left with the meters per second which is a climb rate so the specific axis power tells you so to speak how much climb rate do you have available with your current thrust and the drag that you have at your current speed so if you fly for example in level flight let's say we are flying here we we go full power so we have our maximum thrust whatever thrust we we have currently set and if we divide or, or subtract drag from it um, and as long as this is this part here is greater than one we have the capability to excel accelerate or, or greater zero basically in this case a as soon as they are equal we will have reached a state where we are not going to accelerate so our specific excess power is going to be zero that is for example once we've reached our service ceiling or if we reduce our thrust such that we just maintain our speed in level flight for example okay because we have established in level straight in level flight if we want to maintain a constant speed thrust and drag must be 
equal. But now let's say you want to accelerate and you push the throttle le lever all the way forward. Um, you are going to accelerate and the specific axis power gives you an idea of how much how much climb rate you can get out of this additional thrust that you could either use to accelerate or in our example to climb okay so this is a very handy quantity or definition to um, evaluate an airplane's climb performance. Now obviously you're not going to calculate this inside your cockpit but if you were to have data, thrust data and drag data for, for various speeds and you know for example you want to climb at your best climb speed and you have worked out for example your thrust and your drag that you have at that speed you will be able to determine what kind of climb rate to expect. And again like we did before with the stall speed we can um, see tendencies here. Now obviously if we want to maximize our specific access power we want to maximize our speed because then this goes up. We want to minimize our weight because then this this goes still up. We want to maximize our thrust and we want to minimize our drag. Okay and notice speed in climb direction okay not in this direction speed over ground but into your climb direction yeah um, then we can get high specific excess power and it, it does make sense the faster our plane is going or is capable of flying the more kinetic energy it can carry that we can transfer into potential energy okay obviously in this state once we have established a certain climb and we are again at our equilibrium our specific excess power is gonna be um, let's let's say zero and that means we have established our optimum climb okay because then thrust and drag are going to be equal again this specific excess power is um, to be seen as your flying straight and level and if you were to increase thrust what kind of climb rate could you get out of this okay then you go into your climb then obviously if you were to do the same calculation now what additional okay it's like with the current energy with the current in the current flight state that I am if I'm using all my thrust to 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 climb I won't get any more climb rate out of it so my specific excess power if you will is um, we, we, we are utilizing our entire specific access power for a climb which means we won't have any specific we won't have any access power left right because we, we are using all the access power that we have in straight and level flight to use for a climb so this is how this is to be understood okay all right and again we have a very limited let's say quantities that, that go into here thrust drag velocity and weight quite interesting and from the specific hour or in other words if engineers worked out the specific access power a plane has based on data or calculations they did based on the design you can also determine the climb angle the climb angle that you can achieve or that you should ideally climb at if you have let's say an indication like in a in a modern jet now this applies obviously more to modern jets where you can see pitch ladders you can see a climb angle basically then you might want to know what climb angle should I be at for for my optimum climb for World War two aircraft we would rather focus on what is my ideal climb speed okay all right now this
these are my two cents on on climb performance now to summarize what i've just said or tried to convey and explain to you hopefully successfully is that um, if we know the specific excess power of our aircraft if we worked it out or it's available to us via a manual um, we we do know its potential climb rate in a max performance or in an optimal climb we can determine the climb angle and yeah get to the speed the the, the climb speed that we we should be flying at okay and this we can also we for this we can also go back to our C C D C L plots where we can find our best glide speed, but also from the C D C L plots we can determine our best best climb speeds. Because we want to be close to our lift to drag ratio optimum, obviously. Um, as I said, the specific excess power is a measurement for how much additional thrust does your aircraft have um, that can be transferred into a climb rate because in our definition there's different definitions for specific excess power but the beauty of our definition is it's already given as a climb rate so if we if we if we were to utilize all of our thrust coming from a straight climb uh, sorry straight and level flight how much or how does this additional thrust that we have translate to a, a climb rate okay and here's also why um, the climb rate is going to reduce with altitude for especially for a propeller driven aircraft because our thrust is going to decrease also first of all with speed the faster we fly but it's also going to decrease with altitude. So the higher we go, the less thrust our engine is going to produce because less manifold pressure in the air and so on and so f uh, in, in in the cylinders and so on and so forth. So the specific excess power at um, a higher altitude is going to be less, which is why you you won't expect the same kind of climb performance the closer you get to your service ceiling but for high altitude or altitude dependent uh, performance we need to dedicate another video to I'm not going to cover this in these three videos because um, when we look at the dogfight we, we just want to look at uh, stuff that's relevant for dogfight we are kind of let's say within a limited altitude range unless we do a power dive from 10k all the way to the ground but then the, the fight let's say continues much lower so where we fight is usually a confined bubble which is why we're gonna talk about this maybe at some later point um yeah back to it um you know sorry uh, for a little german here but um the specific ex excess power that you have I'm sorry you can either use to climb accelerate or turn the turn is basically an accelerated flight but you need you and we will see this in the next session you will have a higher thrust demand in a turn so it's good to have a high specific excess power um, to be able to fly high G sustained turns okay but we will get to that now for us pilots this is all good to know and it's uh, good to understand in terms of climb and climb performance however there's going to be two speeds that are relevant for us I'm not referring to a power climb situation where we are basically going vertical um, but if we were to fly a more sustained climb we have two climb speeds that uh, pilots commonly talk about or use we have our so-called VX and, and flying at VX what I'm trying to achieve is to achieve the most high height or altitude above ground with the least ground covered forward okay so 
in order to get from here to here. Since I'm going to fly like this, I'm going to cover a specific ground. Okay. And I want to minimize that distance that I need to get from here to here, and then I fly at Vx. So the problem that I'm trying to solve here is maximize altitude gained with minim minimal um, distance traveled, covered, over ground. The more relevant speed for a performance climb is um, our best climb speed or VY. Okay? Best climb speed tries to solve the following problem. You want to gain most height per time. So what you're basically trying to achieve is maximize altitude gain in the lowest amount of time. And here are two typical examples when to use what speed. Note, since we will fly at a steeper climb angle for Vx, Vx is going to be slower than Vy indicated because we are going to fly at a higher angle. Um, but if, if we fly Vx, we are not going to climb as efficiently in, t in terms of time. Because we saw earlier, speed is somewhat relevant in terms of climb performance. But let's look at the examples here. So you have the following example. You just took off, let's say, and there's an obstacle close to the runway. You are heavily loaded, and you only have a specific distance to that obstacle. Now, if you were, for example, to climb at VY, this distance may not be enough to climb over this obstacle, and you may run into this obstacle. So what you would do is increase your climb angle with whatever is your your air aircraft is capable whilst maintaining a constant speed. Remember both speeds should be flown constant so you cannot just point up because you're gonna slow down so you want to ha fly Vx constant and Vy constant but you would go a bit higher than Vy in terms of climb angle to minimize that distance. Okay? But since you're going to be slower, although the vector points more up, if the vector is in magnitude, let's say, s slower than this one, eventually we're not going to we're not going to reach the same altitude because our um if we were again to plot a v diagram okay sorry we why if I make this shorter but larger still this one is gonna be shorter okay so the climb rate is gonna go down so I'm trying to ex exaggerate here see now this is at a steeper angle Okay, this is at a steeper angle than this one, but since it's smaller, we y is also smaller, so the climb rate is smaller. But the problem is a different one that we are trying to solve here. Okay, now the more typical problem that we are going to face in combat, for example, is we have uh, bogies at a certain altitude maybe a bomber formation, maybe other fighters that we need to engage and we still have some time before we hit them or they merge with us and we want to get to altitude as quickly as possible to as much altitude as, as possible then we would fly at VY. These values should be given in your manual if not um, you need to figure them out by yourself via experiment. Vy for propeller driven aircraft and Vx are somewhere around uh, Vbest glide. You may play around a little bit going a bit above Vbest glide um, and, and compare different speeds in terms of altitudes gained over time, uh, altitude gained over time.
but somewhere in this regime. So it's, it's not going to be too far from V best glide. So for example, 109's best glide speed is between 220 and 240 kilometers an hour. And the best climb speed, let's say, is between 260 and 300 kilometers an hour. So it's not that, that far apart. Okay. Um, yeah. This is what you should know about climb performance. And again, if possible, strive for a climb at constant speed because that's how we maximize our climb performance. Because if we don't fly at a constant speed, we are either going to slow down or we are accelerating. If we utilize all the thrust that's given to us or that the airplane has available, and then we are not climbing efficiently because we want to m utilize all the thrust we have in the best possible way. Okay. Now, to summarize the first two chapters, what you should remember is when we generate lift, we generate drag. We've seen the, the connection between the drag coefficient and the lift coefficient. We have the four forces, lift, weight, thrust, and drag, and they appear as pairs uh, of protagonists and antagonists. Okay, I have not listed this specifically because that's you. Uh, sorry, usually common knowledge. Um, we've learned about the lift equation. That's an equation you should learn. You should remember also in its uh, written out form with the one half row and so on and so forth because a lot a lot can be derived from this one single equation when we talk about turn performance in the next session all we're gonna apply is just this lift equation basically and uh, yeah find quite some important performance parameters from it stall speed in straight flight it can be computed and it is dependent on these variables or quantities remember this you should know how to determine your stall speed or at least know the stall speed of your aircraft and if you ever wondered why it is the way it is this equation gives you the reason and the reason why you should remember this equation is because if you want to evaluate your aircraft stall performance, you need to know what kind of quantities go into it so you know how to optimize it. The exercise that we've been going through, so you want to minimize weight. If you have high lift devices like flaps and so on and so forth, you may want to use them to increase your wing surface area and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, that's why it's it's good to remember. We have talked about specific excess power here in written down as a unit or in a unit of climb rate, which gives us the climb potential. It's basically a climb potential um, for our aircraft. And here, what we've learned, obviously, the more thrust our aircraft can have for its weight and the more aerodynamically sleek it is, so the less drag it produces, obviously the higher our climb potential. And the faster it can go, um, the more kinetic energy that we can put into our climb. Now, for climb performance, we need to know our two climb speeds, Vx and Vy just explained that so remember this we x we are trying to minimize the ground covered for maximum altitude gained over that covered ground it's not going to be the maximum altitude gained over time if we need the maximum altitude gained in a specific amount of time we want to go for uy consult the manual or do trials yourself to figure out these values and that's about it folks this is the first or well, this concludes the first episode of the classroom series we started to look at 
aircraft performance first by looking at the principal forces of flight how lift is generated stalls and so on and so forth and performance limits after all in straight flight both level flight fast and slow speeds as well as climb performance in the next session or episode we are going to look at accelerated flight specifically turn flight and the performance parameters that we can derive from simple thought experiments or considerations we'll make on yeah our airplane on the drawing board okay this was your host Killerfliege I hope you enjoyed this episode you can use the insights gained from it in your daily flying I hope this is going to make you a better pilot and if you enjoyed it consider subscribing to our channel liking the video tell your friends that there's good stuff here on our channel that you can learn from and yeah until then happy flying safe flying always a clear six and see you in the next one killer fliege out